everybody, good morning and welcome to the United Stands. I'm Mark Goldbridge and this is your latest Manchester United news on what could be deal day for Sir Jim Radcliffe. We've certainly got uh, a lot of extra information coming in around full control um, of the footballing side and what that means. Also updates on Dan Ashworth as director of football. Uh, some really interesting stuff around John Murta and Sir Alex Ferguson not being a fan of him. Uh, also, we've got transfer news and the potential that Manchester United could be making a signing before the end of this year. Obviously, the January transfer window doesn't open for another 10 days or so. But remember, last season, Cody Gakpo got announced as a Liverpool player on Boxing Day night. Manchester United could well be doing a very similar thing with another player, namely Garassi of Stuttgart, where apparently it is getting close between Manchester United and Stuttgart towards a deal. What are your thoughts on that? Lots to get into today. Um, let's just start off with, I suppose, the first thing uh, that, 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 that's the most relevant thing. In fact, it's just come out from uh, from Ben Jacobs. I'll pop, it, I'll pop it up on the screen for you there. Um, Ineos and Man United have been working around the clock to try and announce Sir Jim Radcliffe's 25% today. As of this morning, it's in the balance as to whether that's possible. Still not been entirely ruled out, though. And uh, we can also confirm in relation to what Ben Jacobs is saying there that they're not writing it off. Um, I think uh, we've done many a show over the last couple of weeks where we've said it won't be today, it won't be tomorrow, it won't be this week. All I can say is as of now, you know, basically everything will shut down. Everything will, uh, um, everything's going to shut down um, for the for the Christmas period. So I think there's a chance it's going to get announced this afternoon because it's the easiest thing in the world to just go, well, you know, everyone's closing down for Christmas. It won't happen until the new year. The fact that they're still, it's still in the balance, I feel that there is a chance that it will get announced this afternoon. Now, look, what, what will that mean? Um, what will that mean for Manchester United if it again announced this afternoon? I don't actually think we've spoken about this for a while and I think it's important to do it. I mean, as they said in the Times last night, um, the, you know, one of the big delays has been the final settlement is likely to give the petrochemicals billionaire Sir Jim Radcliffe and his Ineos group full say on all major football decisions. These major decisions would include transfers and the right to hire and fire managers, which is quite a massive thing. But having said that, for 25% and also the Glazers want to take the heat off themselves, I'm not surprised about that. I don't think that's a big win. Um, if, if the Glazers had sold the fucking football club to Qatar, then they'd have full control of transfers and everything as well. So I think we've got to be a little bit uh, less hyper. I saw people last night going, get in. So Jim's going to have control of the footballing side. And I was like, get out. Uh, whoever bought the whole club would have had full control anyway. So let's know. You know, it's, it's like it's like it's like the guy who wants PS5 for Christmas and he gets a bloody you know, Game Boy, it's like, um, which was a handhold, it's nothing else, don't worry. But, you know, Sir Jim Radcliffe is giving the Glazers over a billion pounds for 25%. Of course, he's going to want to have some control over the footballing side. I don't think that's breaking news. I think that's what's to be expected. He's buying 25%. What I would say is, and the thing I don't know whether we'll get this afternoon, and the thing that has always bothered me personally is, I want to know, is it, I don't want to hear this afternoon, there's a pathway to full ownership. I want to know, is there full ownership? Like, are you buying the whole club in 2026? Because what I have noticed in the longevity of this whole thing is that when it was first announced that Sir Jim was getting the club, there was a lot of cheerleaders saying, he's going to own all of the club by 2026. He's going to own all of it by 2026. So have we now put that in the gutter? Or as is that still... A thing, and that's really the thing that hopefully will get announced today. That the twenty-five percent is done. I want to hear. I want to. I want to know the pathway, and I don't want to know there's a potential to own all the club. I want to know next year I give them another billion. Next year I give them another billion, and then in twenty twenty-six they're gone. That's what I want to know. Are we going to get that? Because the full footballing side, it's just, it's bloody obvious. You know, absolutely obvious. You don't give the Glazers over a billion quid and then you know, just sit back and let them run it, you know, he's going to bring Ineos sporting expertise in cycling and other sports. Of course, they're going to have a say on the footballing side. I want to know what the pathway is for the future. I want to know about investment into the team. 
I've heard that we're going to put £300 million in in relation to Old Trafford. It's not enough. It's not going to touch the sides. What's going into the team? What's happening around that? So there's there's so much. And I don't think, I don't know we'll get it. Um, I was speaking to somebody last night and they said, look, this is going to be an announcement to the New York Stock Exchange and the world that Sir Jim Radcliffe is buying 25%. If you think he's going to sit down and do an interview on a Friday telling you in depth what's going to happen... I think it's just going to be a statement, a very short statement, uh, and everyone goes off and enjoys Christmas. And then after Christmas, you'll get more and more. Um, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, Cameron, welcome to the Members Club. Ah, I've just reminded myself, I have to do this. Merry Christmas to everybody. I've got to do this very quickly. I wore this on stage for the Christmas show. If you've not watched the Christmas show, it's up on the Members section. Make sure you check it out if you're a member or become a member. This is uh, what I wore. There's only one of these in existence. And the reason for that is we printed a thousand of them. It's a knitted Christmas jumper, but the prototype had a white collar. What you got was a red collar. I actually think the white collar is the best, but there's only one in existence and I own it. I was, uh, I, um, I'm giving it away. I'm giving it away. So we're giving this away. Um, and you won't get it in time for this Christmas, but it's a one-off. It's uh, a 20 times knitted uh, United Stand jumper. There's only one in existence. We're giving this away. Um, all you've got to do is check out the podcast, which went out today. Our Christmas special podcast. Link's in the live uh, chat, or just go Goldbridge Saves Football. Listen to, to it today, and uh, you'll see how you enter. And you, as United Stand viewers, have got the best chance of winning because when you know how you enter you'll have the answer. So one in existence. I'm, I'm reluctant to give it away, but you know, you've done so much for us and especially the people who've supported the podcast from this community. You've done so much for us. I wanted to give something away that, you know, was personal to me and this community. So there's only one of those and it will last you forever because it's knitted. Um, is it used, says Sin. I, I, I will wash it. I, I, I'm planning to wash it before I send it out. Some people actually, you know, if you look on the internet, people like to buy people's... Um, tights that have been worn. Disgusting uh, stuff. Uh, does the 25% sale uh, affect financial fair play restrictions on transfers, says Ranyik? Got no idea. Uh, Cameron says, morning, Mark. Hope you well. Have you read the latest article on The Athletic on the inside football operation at United? I'm bringing it into this show, Cameron. We're bringing it into the show. Uh, it's a new show. We've got lots to talk about. And uh, Tao says, uh, so Sir Jim wants the power to be able to hire and fire the manager. Is that a hint already? Because there are other important things to do first, says Tao. Look, I personally Personally, uh, Drip says don't wash it. Um, I personally think that um, the manager is under threat. Um, I've said that before. Um, in relation to this, we've got a lot to get into this morning. But if you, you know, we're 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 a, we're a uh, we are a community, and we you know we do talk things and we do go off on tangents. I think Ten Hag's job's in danger. Um, I hope to be proved wrong on that, but I think he's in danger because what that means is we've got a twenty five percent owner who has full control of the footballing side. Well, if I was buying 25% of Manchester United and I had control of the footballing side, I'm basically owner of the football side. Um, the commercials, the you know, the profits, everything, I'm, I'm not in control of that, but I am in control of the footballing side. When new owners come into football clubs, they tend to sack the manager. Well, Sir Jim Radcliffe's got control of the footballing side and he's a new controller of the footballing side. Therefore, I think there is a chance that at some point in the next six months, Ten Hag will be moved on. Um, I've got no information on that. I just think, logically, as Ricky would say, two plus two is Matic, I would say, new manager, new owner. New ideas. And and, and that's just what I think. But what Ten, can, what Ten Hag can do, and has to do, and I said it on the preview last night, if he starts winning games, he can't be sacked. If it carries on like it has done for the last few months, I think he'll be gone. So let's see what happens with it. But there are a couple of other bits uh, to bring you uh, from the Times article as well. Um, they are also... Where was it? Where was it? Where was it? I saw it this morning. I saw it this morning. Um, yeah, we've done that one. Um, here we go. This is it. Even if everything is completed tomorrow, meaning today, um, it will be several weeks before Sir Jim Radcliffe's deal is fully ratified by the Premier League and other bodies, and it'll have to be announced via the New York Stock Exchange. Now, the New York Stock Exchange opens at around 2, 2.30 UK time today. So we aren't going to get any announcement before 2, 2.30 today. If this gets announced, 
will be going live around 2.30, 3, 4 o'clock. I, I, I don't see it being um, a Friday evening at 6 o'clock sort of thing. I, don't, I certainly don't think it's going to be this morning. So interesting on that. As for the everything's going to take a few weeks... Yes, everything will take a few weeks. I think we're fully aware everything's going to take a full week, a few, few weeks, but that won't stop Manchester United um, being active in the January transfer window because if I'm buying 25% and I'm going to have control of the footballing side, then I can be having a word with such and such and such and such and saying, we think this is a good move, we think this is a good move. So they, they it's not like, I don't think it's that stringent that Sir Jim Radcliffe and his uh, advisors can't be advising before they officially take control, um, is my understanding. But there we go. Um, which leads us into what would have been our lead story today, but there's so much to talk about. I've got an update on Dan Ashworth being the new sporting director as well. But this is significant. Um, numerous outlets have been talking about Garassi to Manchester United over the last couple of days. I feel this is the most uh, significant update of all. Uh, Christian Falk is a, a German journalist, uh, very, very close to Bayern Munich and very good connections within the Bundesliga. Uh, he is saying that Garassi wants to leave Stuttgart in January, which is very significant. Obviously, everybody knows. Uh, at, at Alex, welcome to the Members Club, by the way. Obviously, everybody knows that... Um, there is this uh, release clause for Garassi around 15 million quid or uh, 15 million euros. Um, but obviously that may well be there, but it's whether the player wants to go. Well, apparently he does want to go um, and he wants to move to the Premier League. Remember, he's 27 years of age. I think he's 28 next March. He's, had a, he's scored a lot of goals this season for Stuttgart. So it's Manchester United and Newcastle are the favourites to sign him. Now, what we're hearing is that if this deal is going to get done, <coughs> excuse me, I was, on, I was on the drink last night. I'm not going to be sick. I just uh, had a little bit of a cough. Um, effectively, this deal could go the way that Gakpo went last year. Now, I'm uh, last year, Gakpo, I'm thinking Man United are going to get him. Sat there, Boxing Day, night, family, playing Monopoly, you know, and then the next thing I know, I'm getting a message about um, Gakpo signed for Liverpool. So what we're expecting is that the Garassi deal could be announced before the end of the year in relation to where he's going. Now, Newcastle are interested, but I agree with what Suham said here. Newcastle have got both Wilson and Isaac who are doing good for them while we are looking for uh, to move on Martial. So maybe we do get this deal done. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with you. I'm like, um, I don't know whether we should get this deal done. Um, that is something that I, I, I would say. I, I don't know that we, that, we, that, we would, that we will get this deal done. But what I will say is that um, it's, it's difficult to um, understand how Manchester United would miss out on Garassi if they wanted him, considering Newcastle's probably not the right place for Garassi to go to. I don't think he I don't think he fits Newcastle. I don't and, and for the same reason, I don't think he definitely uh, fits Manchester United. But why would he fit Newcastle? Newcastle are the sort of club with the wealth to go and buy the next Harry Kane in the next two years. So why would you buy Garassi, who's probably not as good as Isaac at, or Wilson? Um, and I, I'm not sure he is. So, I mean, that says a lot. I don't think Garassi is better than Wilson or Isaac. I, I, I don't know what you think in the chat. I don't think he is. I don't think Garassi or, is better than Wilson or Isaac. I don't. So why would Newcastle want to bring him in and why would he want to go there? Um, this deal, to me, worries me. It worries me that it's a little bit of... Uh, um, not even a risk... Um, not even a stopgap, uh, panic. It, it, it strikes me as a little bit of a panic signing. I haven't I haven't seen enough of this guy to say he's a solution for Manchester United. He may well be, but it's sort of one season. It's, it's one season where he scored a lot of goals for Stuttgart. Now, players can develop lately, but... Sorry, players can develop late, but I'm just... I'm not sure about this deal. Um... But he could be a Man United player by January the 1st. Manchester United could get this deal done quite quickly. 15 million euros. He wants to play in the Premier League. Man United and Newcastle uh, are apparently very, very close to 
the deal. Um, what are your thoughts on it? Um, I'll do a little bit of a poll. It's 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 a hard one, <laughs> it, but it is. It's a it's a hard one to predict because if you buy him, then I'll back him because that's how it works. Um, but I'm also like, what's the alternative really when you're heading into a January transfer window uh, without a hell of a lot of money, which is the situation that Man United find themselves in. Um, it would certainly make it would certainly give us an option in the striking area, but um, yeah, I, I'm not I'm not I'm not totally and utterly enamoured with it. Um, it, it. In some ways, it's it's good because it gives Manchester United another striker option. Uh, I mean. If I'm being honest, I'm going to be honest again, twice. Could could, uh, could Guernsey end up scoring more than Rasmus? I think you mean Garassi says in, uh, international. Um, I think I, I'll say it again. Um, I think Martial's better than Garassi as well. <laughs> so um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't really get this deal. And uh, look, dare I say it as well? I will do. I will do. Um, Anthony Martial is 28. He's only just 28. Garassi is 28 in March. I think that they're basically the same age, and I think Martial's better. That doesn't mean I want to keep Martial. I just I think we have to move Martial on. But um, yeah, it's we'll see what happens. Man United fan for life. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to Members Club. Uh, a lot of people saying uh, Martial is not as good as Garassi. I think Martial is better than Garassi. I actually think Anthony Martial um, needs to move. 100% needs to move. And I I I'm not going to doubt that. But I do think his treatment by the UK media and press and some of our fans, if he was British then he would have easily been able to come out and talk about, you know, his mental health and how he gets treated, etc. Because I do think it's appalling some of the stuff that's been levelled against Martial. I'm not saying that he's not injury prone. I'm not saying that he's not consistent. But, you know, the word lazy has been used against him so many times. I, I, you know, you called, if you, used a, if you said that, some of the stuff that's been said about him, I just think is, is bang out of order. But we always, always seem to come back to this the way that, you know, the media can talk about foreign players. I mean, I, I, Anthony, they never shut up about Anthony. They're constantly talking about Anthony. Um, it's almost like if you haven't got a British passport, it's open season to every type of abuse. And um, I think Martial has had a ridiculous amount of abuse and some of it has been, you know, over the top. You certainly wouldn't hear people saying it about Harry Maguire or Marcus Rashford, in my opinion. We should prioritise selling Martial as well as getting Garassi. Also get Veghorst back on loan, says Colin. And uh, Bruno creates the most chances in the Premier League. Rasmus gets no service. One of these stats doesn't add up, says Shane. Well, no, it does, Shane. Of course it bloody well does. Do you, I, 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 sorry, sorry, Shane, it is Christmas. I'm going to be forgiving. Um, but uh, I've heard this before and it got a lot of interaction on social media and I left it. But you're a member of the United Stand community, so I'm going to answer it. Um, it does add up. Bruno creates more chances than anybody in the Premier League but Rasmus doesn't get any service. It does add up because that stat for Bruno goes back to 2020 and Rasmus has only been here since the summer. So we can only deal with this season. Now, Bruno has still created a lot of chances this season, but they're not all for Rasmus. You know, and what's a chance? What is a chance? Is a chance Bruno Fernandes passing the ball five yards to Marcus Rashford or Ganacho and Anthony and then cutting inside and having a shot? Yes, so when Bruno passes it to Anthony, he cuts inside and curls it over the bar when he shouldn't be shooting, that's a chance. So it's about... Bruno is very good at creating chances, but he doesn't create five chances a game for, for Rasmus or, or Ronaldo or anybody else. Hi, Mark. I've been watching your channel since 2016. Says Man United fan for life. You're a legend, mate. Thank you very much. And Ant says, Anthony's been one of our best players the last few games. The hate in the media is unbelievable. Uh, it's in the chat as well, mate. It's in the chat as well. Uh, I, I think I think Anthony's been playing well the last few games. I agree. Um, um, 
Levi says that something about Bellingham, such disrespect to Sir Alex from Murta. Can we get your thoughts? I'm going to talk about that, yes. Uh, Mark, considering huge funds we get from being in the Premier League, sponsor deals and the world's largest average crowds, we should be rolling in funds, says George. Well, you might want to look at uh, Glazonomics, mate, as to why we we aren't uh, rolling in funds. But um, let me just uh, get this for you. But look, um, there is a story that's come out from Laurie Whitwell this morning, and I would call it uh, a prep piece, basically. Um, Manchester United, obviously... Um, moving very, very close, as I said at the start of the show, if you're tuning in late, Manchester United moving very, very close to the uh, the announcement of 25% uh, from Sir Jim Radcliffe. We actually expect that to get announced today. We will see, but we are, in, we are expecting that today. Um, but in preparation for that, I think a lot of people have been speaking about the past and the problems that, that go on at Manchester United, and, and therefore um, we can... Um, focus on that for a moment or two. It's a piece from Laurie Whitwell. Um, and, and one of the interesting things coming out from this article, there's quite a few, few bits, but this is really interesting. When Jude Bellingham visited Carrington in March 2020, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and his assistants felt Sir Alex Ferguson would add a glamorous finish to their analytical presentation. John Murta had a different view. Ferguson shook hands with Bellingham, but Murta guided the player and his parents out of the room for a tour of the facilities rather than having time to talk with Sir Alex. Sir Alex was reportedly not happy at the perceived slight and said so to Murta's face at a later date. I mean, that's amateur hour. Um, I don't think for one minute that means that uh, Jude Bellingham was going to sign for Manchester United. I, I, I think that he made the right choice um, and uh, I don't think that there's, there's there's any doubt about that. However, what the, what the, what there is doubt about is um, that there is certainly a feeling that um, it's just very amateur. It's very amateur what's going on at Manchester United, and it's been very amateur for a long time. And I think that's what this piece from Laurie Whitwell in the Athletic is saying is that there's a lot of information coming out. I mean, what I will say is. And, and we must always be very fair about this. This is a very detailed bit of information about our current director of football and a, and a conversation with Sir Alex Ferguson that's gone to Laurie Whitwell. And everyone will go, Murta is an absolute prat. Murta this, Murta that. But can we also acknowledge that this is Whitwell, like Lookhurst, like others, being spoken to by somebody giving very detailed information from the inner workings of Manchester United. And it's fantastic that we get to go, well, Murta's a complete and utter prat. You've got Bellingham there. You only let Sir Alex shake hands with him when he could have had a chat with him about, you know, what Man United's all about. And of course, it throws Murta under the bus. But the cynic in me says, why are we getting this story three, four years later? The day that Sir Jim Radcliffe's about to get hold of the club. And oh, hold on a minute. Is this the positive PR spin that we were talking about three days ago? Of course it is. And I acknowledge it for what it is. So Jim Radcliffe, Ineos, Manchester United have got to spin the shit out of this story of 25% with the Glazers. They've got to. They've got to get as much positivity around it as they can. And how do you do that? Well, you do it with stories like this. You do it with stories like John Murta's rubbish at his job because he's the next one to go, isn't he? Um, I feel a bit... I, you know, I, I don't normally... Um, I heard that United are also interested in Tadebo, says Craig. Thanks for that. Um, I um, I don't normally feel sorry for John Murta, because I don't think he's very good at his job. But I do think he's a bit of a fool guy this morning, ahead of this announcement, that, you know, look at John Murta, he's a prat. Look at John Murta, he's a prat. Well, we, we, we've sort of known that for a long time. But I will just say... What's different to somebody giving a very detailed situation around John Murta and his director of football uh, ship um, today than what we've had against the manager recently? There are a hell of a lot of leaks in that football club. Uh, look at Spurs with Kulisevsky and Madison. That's what makes them so dangerous. We need more creative players for Rasmus. What's the thoughts on the lack of creativity, says Andre? I, I think it's not good enough. I think it's not good enough. Um, Connor, um, and, and, and I think that um, it's, I think from Rasmus's point of view, he needs more creativity from the wing. Uh, Bruno's a number 10. It's hard to create for an, uh, 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 it's hard for Bruno to create the chances from the width 
for, for Rasmus. Uh, Connor says Mert is a chancer there because he's a good at politicating and not on merit of his achievements. Uh, epitome of how the whole club is currently run. Well, I wouldn't disagree with that, Connor. And, and this as well, coming out from the article... John Murta was offered the role as a footballing director a couple of years ago at Manchester United to stop him from leaving for Inter Miami. Well, I think you could, you know, like those quotes, you know, there's like quotes from um, all these great, uh, like Gandhi, uh, William Shakespeare, um, Sir Winston Churchill, um, you know, um, all these great people of the past. And I think this could be framed as one of those. Because it's, it, 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 it literally is. It says everything. We gave him the director of football job because he'd been offered a job by Inter Miami. Phil Neville managed Inter Miami. That, look, Inter Miami, what, when all said and done, it, it's the MLS. <laughs> and, and respect the MLS if you like it. I haven't watched it for years. But John Murtagh's talks about going to Inter Miami and Man United giving the director of football job. It's it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Um, and also, in addition to that, apparently Richard Arnold spoke to Sir Alex Ferguson and David Gill about the problems that they were having in the transfer market. And Sir Alex and David Gill recommended that they approach Dan Ashworth when he was at Brighton. Uh, they approached Dan Ashworth, who was interested, but then rejected it because he didn't want to work under John Murta. So I think this information is very interesting. That's interesting. The Jude Bellingham story is interesting. The story about approaching Dan Ashworth before he went to Newcastle, but making him work under John Murta is interesting. I think what we have here is just another picture painted of how incompetent Man United's board recruitment has been. And this strange obsession around John Murta, who I've always said, probably a really nice guy, probably works really hard, works from seven, six o'clock till ten o'clock every morning, um, every night, not doesn't do four hours. Um, but ultimately, he's not good enough. And like a like like a centre back at Man United, I don't care whether they're a nice guy. If you're not good enough, ruthless, get rid. And I think for too long, United have been about nice guys and mates and stuff like that. You've got to go and get the best. And it's such an easy principle, and I fully expect it to happen with Sir Jim, is that, and it would happen with Qatar as well, and any other club that's run properly, is that you've got to have that ruthless aggression to get the best. And United have tried to be successful with people who are mediocre, and that's why it's left us in this position. Will Ten Hag play Beinder against Wigan in the Cup, says Ishan. Uh, I think he'll have to, won't he? Welcome to the Members Club, Tom and Dominic. Appreciate your support. Don't forget to check out the Christmas show. Um, still more to bring you. The Dan Ashworth story comes into this actually quite nice here. So let me just remove that from the screen for you. Um, um, I want to go back to that, but there is something I just want to talk about, about in relation to Dan Ashworth. So basically, um, the situation with Dan Ashworth at the moment, and this is coming in from the mail, is that... Um, Newcastle are confident that they're going to keep Dan Ashworth. Now, if you don't know who Dan Ashworth is, he's not a striker. He is the mastermind of Brighton's success. He's gone to Newcastle as a sporting director and he's played a massive part in what they're doing as well. So Dan Ashworth is considered to be one of the best sporting directors in European football at the moment. Man United had approached him before apparently, but he didn't want to work under John Murta. He wanted to be in control. So Man United missed out, Pratt. Anyway, uh, so David Brailsford, who works with Ineos, he wants a sporting director and a transfer expert. And this is why Man United potentially could be looking at uh, Paul Mitchell as the transfer expert and uh, Dan Ashworth as the sporting director. It would be a dream team, whether it's Man United, Liverpool, you know, those two would be considered a very good fit for any Premier League club in any position. So it would be good if they could do it. Um Manchester United are very interested in Dan Ashworth. Newcastle are very confident they're going to keep him. According to the Mail, it's a 12-month notice period for Dan Ashworth. Um, there is no release clause, but it's felt that it would cost around one and a half to £2 million for Manchester United to get him out of his contract um, if he was offered the job. Um, but uh, Newcastle remain confident that they can keep him. So... And this is the problem, isn't it? I think a lot of people start going, oh, Dan Ashworth, well, it could lead to Potter, this, that and the other. The reality is he's very, very good at his job. 
But it is in a way, it is like it is like being linked to a, a player that we're not going to sign that we'd like to sign. Um, I, I've always said I don't know why he'd leave Newcastle and I don't know why Newcastle wouldn't fight to keep him. So, look, that's still on the cards. Um, he might really fancy the Man United job. But if he does, then we we may be able to get him. But um, that's the that's the latest on Dan Ashworth. Um, and well, I suppose we'll just have to wait and see what happens with that. Um, there is a few more bits in the Laurie Whitwell story just to go back to. Uh, I'll put one of them up on the screen. But also there's a little bit about Anthony I wanted to bring in. But basically it says that Manchester United obviously had to work very, very quickly with Ten Hag because they didn't appoint him until the May um, and most clubs that are competent are working on their transfer window way before May. Um, I've wrote, I've put the wrong one up. I've put the wrong one up. That's not the one I want to put up. But that's not the one I want to put up. This is the one. So when Man when Ten Hag arrived at Manchester United, he asked John Murta for a midfielder in the mould of Frankie de Jong and an established centre forward and a left footed centre back. Now, obviously, we got a left footed centre back in Martinez. We ended up getting Casemiro at the back end of the transfer window, having spent all summer, trying to get Frankie de Jong, but we didn't get an established centre-forward. And I think that's important to remember because he did want, and, you know, whatever you think about it, you know, everyone's going to have their opinion, but he did want um, Darwin Nunez and he did want an established striker at the start of last year, um, but uh, when he first came to the club. And obviously he didn't get that. So uh, I think it's important to remember that... Um, Rasmus is a player, I was out last night and a lot of people were talking to me about Rasmus and I was like, you know, some people were giving him a lot of shit and I was like, no, um, uh, I, I really, really, really rate uh, Rasmus and I think he's, uh, I think I'm going to get proven right. Um, I, I, think we, I think I'm going to get proven right on Rasmus. I, I definitely think he's going to... Um, Signed for Man uh, not signed for Manchester United. Um, I can tell you can tell I went out last night. Apologies. I'll get better as the day goes on. But I, I'm convinced Rasmus is going to be a, a brilliant striker, and I don't mind if I'm in the minority. I don't mind if most of you are with me. But Rasmus, we will be proven right. Um, I was listening to the call in last night with Faz and Maud, and um, I noted that there was a little bit of uncertainty towards Rad Rasmus in that. But I'm absolutely convinced he's going to be a success. I think he's got all the traits. You know, I'm, I look at someone like Veghorst and I go, yeah, he's, he's, he's nowhere near good enough to play. I look at someone like Rasmus, he's definitely good enough. And I think he'll get better and better. He's only 20. But let's not forget, Ten Hag did want an established striker when he first came to the club. And even a year later, they didn't give him an established striker. They gave him a young striker. So it just shows you that as a Man United manager, you don't always get what you want. But there's also a point in there that um, there's nobody at Man United capable of assessing a player's value and then going out and getting them for that value. Well, wait, you know, no shit, Sherlock. We've known that for a long time. But it references in the Laurie Whitwell article that um, Anthony, Man United, had assessed Anthony, even in Solskjaer's days, as a player worth about £25 million. Um, look... I think the whole Whitwell article is somebody leaking to him to make this Sir Jim deal look really good. Um, and I agree with that. I, I, I agree with that because you've got to have positive PR around a change. Um, and it's not hard to shovel up shit from Man United over the last few weeks and months and years about how we do it on transfers. I think the overarching thing is not um, breaking news. Man United are crap at transfers. The Bellingham story we've spoken about, you know, we're crap. We've, we've, we're, we're rubbish. I don't even need to speak to anyone from Manchester United. I can speak to Fabrizio. I can speak to other agents and they will tell me what they've been telling me for years, that Man United's reputation in the footballing transfer world is that of a circus. Everyone knows you can mug them off. Players' agents that... Uh, players that come to Man United mug us off. And their agent knows it. This is what we've created at Man United. The players that sign for us mug us off. It's not passion to come to Manchester United. It's we can get a lot of money there. How, how, when you think about it, why is it a surprise we are where we are when players come to United 
to mug us off. Like, you can get ridiculous wages here. We've got players in that playing squad who came here rather than maybe a Man City or somewhere else because of the wages we're paying. It's almost like you've won the lottery. And the agents are going, you've got to go to Man United. They're going to double your wages. You're not going to be on 100 grand a week. You're going to be on 200 grand a week. So, look, there is a lot of material to take the piss out of Manchester United. And Laurie's obviously done that and other people will do it as well. And it all needs to change. But... Anthony, 25 million in the Solskjaer days. We paid 85 million euros for Anthony. Now, I like Anthony, but one of the big problems we have with Anthony is that he is tainted by that price tag. And, and the wage we gave him, I think he went from 20 grand a week to 180 grand a week, which is just mind boggling. But that's on Murta. That's on Arnold. That's on negotiators like Matt Judge. And that is ridiculous. But remember, the reason we paid 85 million euros for Anthony was because we didn't do the deal until the last week of the transfer window. That summer, you can go back to it because it was June the 10th, I did a video on the United stand saying, expecting the next few days, Man United to be linked to Anthony strongly by the UK press because talks were already taking place. And within three or four days of that video, talks with Anthony were going through the UK press. So Man United had an opportunity to get Anthony on June the 10th, and they waited till the end of August, by which time Ajax had sold most of their squad and didn't want to sell anybody else. So Man United had to pay a king's ransom to get Anthony. If they'd gone and done it in June, they'd have got him for 50 million quid. They ended up paying 85 million euros. So, look, it's not Anthony's fault. It's not Ten Hag's fault for wanting Anthony. It is, yet again, the problem of how we do our transfers. And, and, and it needs breaking down and, and uh, rebuilding. And if that's Dan Ashworth, Paul Mitchell and Blanc, then, you know what, that will be a massive, massive improvement for Manchester United. But, look, that's not going to be enough for Sir Jim. Sir Jim, Rad Sir Jim Radcliffe cannot live off bringing in Dan Ashworth and Paul Mitchell because Dan Ashworth and Paul Mitchell cannot make Man United Man City if they haven't got the funds so there's a reality bite for you we can all start holding hands and saying it's Christmas because we're going to get a new director of football and a new CEO etc but they will not make Manchester United successful in the current financial climate you can't you've still got a load of players on stupid money that you can't sell you've still got financial fair play and where's the money coming from to buy the new players? I mean, Paul Mitchell and Dan Ashworth are great, but they're not miracle workers. So we've got to be very careful about the spin. I embrace the spin. I expect the spin. I've got no problem with this po positive spin. But you've also got to scratch the surface of it because a new director of football and a new CEO is not going to make Man United challenge Man City because you've got to have a hell of a lot more than that. It's like sacking the manager. It's not just the manager. It's not just the players. It's not just the director of football. It's not just the stadium. There's loads of things that need sorting out at that football club. And it will take a long time for Manchester United to do it. Um, Hi, Mark. You didn't welcome me to the members club, says Usman. Been following you for years, but couldn't become a member due to my previous location. It's a pleasure to join the community. Usman, welcome very uh, welcome very much. Uh, and also, don't forget to check out the uh, Christmas show, which you can check. Um would you sign Garassi? 65% of you would, 35% of you wouldn't. So that's uh, that's very interesting uh, there. Jaron says Kevin De Bruyne is back. Mate, I know Man City don't have many fans and therefore have next to no fan content, but you can't come on the Man United uh, fan content and tell us about Man City injury news. Don't give a shit. What are we doing about the stadium? How can we invest in our stadium and the squad, says Jay. And... Um, isn't Garassi going to be going to the AFCON? <laughs> you know what? I think I think so. I think so. Um, Mark, what are your thoughts on the delays and if we still get that new ownership bounce despite the deal having to go through the reg? United, we stand. I've never heard of a new ownership bounce. I've heard of a new manager bounce. I've never heard of a new ownership bounce. What, what What's a new ownership bounce then? So we get new owners and the players start playing well. I mean, it might happen. We, we might get that. Hi, Mark. What are your thoughts on Man United and other Premier League clubs rejecting the Super League, says Musty? Well, 
uh, I think, I, I, yeah, I, I think there's more to come on that. I, th I think there's, I think there is a lot more to come on that. If I'm being honest, yeah. Um, Newcastle had a new owner bounce, says Tabasco. Yeah, 25% ownership bounce, says Aimless. Maybe, maybe we'll see an improvement of 25%. Look, in, in relation to, uh, look, it feels a long time, doesn't it? Because um, that Liverpool game feels like a long time ago. But we, we, we will hear from Ten Hag. Um, we're gonna. I'm, I'm doing the press conference at lunchtime, so we, we are going to hear from Ten Hag, of course, um, at lunchtime. And uh, look, I, 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 I'll say this right now: um, we've had some pretty accurate information coming in on the sale of Man United for the last few weeks. We've been in a position where we can be on the morning show and say it's definitely not happening this week. It's definitely not happening today. It's definitely not happening tomorrow. What I will say is that those sources are saying that. It's not definitely not happening today. So it's nearly 11 o'clock in the UK. I think to be in a position where it gets announced before Christmas would be great because um, we can then enjoy the game tomorrow and then we can see what happens in January. I'm really hopeful that, you know, 2, 2.30 today, we might be going, bang, it's a done deal. This is what we know. What I will say is, though, and I will prepare you for this because I'm preparing myself, when it gets announced we might not get war and peace. And what I mean by that is, I would like to get a raft of information. The, the pathway to own the full... I would love to get an announcement that 25% today, and it's agreed that um, the Glazers will be gone in 2026. And it's written in law that they'll be gone in 2026. I'd love that. I don't think we're going to get that. I think we might just get... So Jim Radcliffe is going to take 25% of the club. It now needs to be ratified by the Premier League. So Jim's looking forward to taking Manchester United back to where they are with investment in the stadium and the playing squad and working collectively with the Glazers with a pathway to full ownership at some point in the future. I think that might be the statement. And in which case, you've not really got... We're, we're no further forward, are we? But um, look, we can live in hope. We certainly can live in hope. Um, and, I, and, I, and I certainly hope that... Um, there is a brighter future for Manchester United because it's uh, it's certainly not been one for quite a while. Um, and also, let's not forget, massive game tomorrow. Massive game tomorrow for Manchester United against West Ham. And we talk about Sir Jim, we talk about the Glazers, we talk about Garassi, but at three o'clock tomorrow afternoon, if we've lost to West Ham, that's Christmas fucking ruined, isn't it? So... We've, we've, it's all going on, isn't it? And, and I think it'd be a different, difficult, difficult, difficult game for Manchester United. Jim will fix it, says DBR. Yeah, that's not a good. Uh, yeah, that, that's not going to fill people with confidence. How that went? Um, will Sir Jim be able to buy the rest of the shares from the greedy Glazers? Says Baku. Well, I, this is what I want to know. Um, Santa says hi, Mark. I just wanted to wish you and all the United Stand community a Merry Christmas, and please can you call my sons Tyler and Harry a pair of prats? Well, Merry Christmas to all of you. And Tyler and, Tyler and Harry apparently are a prat. Um, that reminds me, a uh, little gift back. The new crit, the, the go, the, the, God, God, I need to go and rest my mouth. Um, gonna go for a walk. I was out last night. It's Christmas. Went. To, I didn't even have that many. I had about five pints, and I, and I went for a lovely curry. And I was in, I was in bed for midnight, but um, I do feel a little bit blurry today, which is obviously coming across in my voice, not working. Now then, um, the I read that because I saw that um, Christmas gift. Uh, if you weren't here at the start of the show, this is a collector's item. There was only ever one made. Every year we do a knitted jumper series for Christmas. We have the blue and white one this year. Um, this was last year's, um, but it's the only one with the white collar. We did it with a red collar, and I actually think in hindsight. The white collar looks better than the red. So we're giving this away. There's only one in, ex in existence. I wore it for the Christmas show. So it's debatable. I will wash it. Um, that will be coming to you. You won't get it for Christmas, but um, you will get it for many other Christmases. A number 20 on the back. It's an absolute cracker and it's a collector's item. Um, all you've got to do to win this, because only one of you can win it, is go to the uh, Goldbridge Saves Football podcast, which came out today. Um, obviously, give us a follow and watch it. But um, within that podcast... Um, are the details on how you win this. Very easy to win it. And I think as a United Stand viewer, you will have more insight to be able to win that. That's all I'm going to say. So check out the podcast, the link's in the live chat, or go to Goldbridge Saves Football on Spotify. Give it a listen. Get into, get your entries in and um, you could be winning that. I mean, I'm sad to give it away. I'm sad to give it away. But you know what? You lot give so much time and 
so much to this community. I wanted to give something that was important to me. Uh, what about the Kubo interest, uh, Mark? It's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit thin. It's a bit thin. The Kubo interest. Um, Saucier Dad. I don't think they'd be looking to sell him till the summer. We've got Anthony. We've got Palistri. We've got Ahmad. We've got Ganacho. We've got Rashford. I, I don't. I like Kubo, but I, I don't. I don't see it happening. Um, uh, and uh, there we go. Um, Joe says, please write down what you've just said. I think you've predicted the statement word for word. So Joe thinks when I said that Man United will put a statement out saying we're glad to confirm that Sir Jim Radcliffe is now owns 25% of the business. Um, he's looking forward to um, um, taking Manchester United back to the top and investing in the stadium and the, and the players and the same side uh, with a pathway to, uh, at some point in the future, taking full control from the Glazers. Let's see how accurate that is. I want a lot more detail than that, definitely. ZD, uh, ZD, welcome to the Members Club. Thank you very much. Uh, don't forget the Christmas show. About 2,000 of you have watched it already on the Members section. Uh, part two is going out on Christmas Eve, which is the second half of the show where Ben Foster's on. It's well worth watching that, actually, because I pinned him down about uh, an honour as well. Um, but, um, yeah, that's on the members section for you. Give it a listen. Um, and don't forget to check out the podcast um, where you can win that. It's a bloody good podcast, actually. We spoke about the Super League. And finally, if you are interested, um, at midday today on That's Football, I'm dropping a video that um, you might have seen hinted for a few weeks now. If you ever used to play Wembley Knockout at school or World Cup, basically a goalkeeper in goal, a few of you playing out, you score and you go through, last people go out. Um, we've done this um, down at Charlton with a load of YouTubers and it's out at midday. I'm the goalkeeper and I'm the ref. So look, I've, I've been given a lot of stick to VAR over the weeks. Can Goldbridge be a better ref? You'll have to watch. There's some controversial stuff that's out at midday on That's Football. A bit of Christmas fun. Uh, take care, everyone. I'm back for the press conference about half one, two o'clock. And I could well be back this afternoon for the announcement of Sir Jim, which could be a very small announcement, but we'll see. Take care, everyone. Lots for you to get involved in. Make sure if you want to win that jumper, you go on the podcast, Goldbridge Saves Football. And obviously that video coming out at midday is a bit of fun. I'm looking forward to watching it myself. Speak to you in a bit. Take care.